1985, the skies above Europe told two very different stories. On one side of the Iron Curtain, NATO pilots climbed into sleek supersonic jets loaded with cutting-edge avionics. On the other side, the Soviet bloc kept pressing forward with its own formidable machines. But in Romania, a country caught between the ambitions of Moscow and the desire for independence, pilots were still strapping themselves into aircraft designed in the 1950s and 1960s, relics of a world that had already moved on. The roar of those old L-29 Delphines and L-39 Albatross trainers no longer inspired confidence. They were slow, outdated, and carried the memory of a time when Romania's choices were dictated by someone else. For the young cadets walking toward the flight line, the contrast was brutal. They dreamed of becoming modern jet fighter pilots, but their first lessons in the cockpit were given by machines that already belonged to the past. If you want to keep uncovering stories like this one, from the hidden struggles of aviation history to the machines that shaped entire generations of pilots, make sure to subscribe and never miss the next chapter. The political backdrop made the situation even heavier. Nikolai Ceausescu's regime demanded self-reliance at all costs. Imports were cut, resources were scarce, and the propaganda machine insisted that Romania could stand on its own feet, even as its people waited in long lines for bread and fuel. In this atmosphere, the military became both a tool of pride and a painful reminder of limitations. The leadership could not admit weakness, and yet the reality was clear. The Romanian Air Force was dangerously behind. Training pilots on obsolete jets meant more than just inconvenience. It meant risking their lives when the time came to transfer into faster and more complex combat aircraft. Every landing was a gamble with worn-out systems. Every takeoff was a reminder that while the world raced into the future, Romania was tied to the past. The Cold War added urgency to this dilemma. In the mid-1980s, tension between East and West had not softened. American F-16s and F-18s were already rewriting the rules of aerial combat. The Soviet Union pushed its own advances with the MiG-29 and Su-27, aircraft that represented leaps in maneuverability and power. Romania, though officially aligned with the Warsaw Pact, had always kept a peculiar distance from Moscow, insisting on its autonomy and political decisions. That independence came at a cost. Fewer direct transfers of the latest Soviet technology, and a growing need to find national solutions to problems the rest of the bloc solved through Moscow's pipeline. One of those problems was painfully clear, the lack of a modern trainer. Without it, the pipeline of future fighter pilots would collapse. Inside military academies, instructors knew the danger. They had cadets full of talent, young men who had spent years studying aerodynamics, navigation, and tactics. But when it came to putting them in the cockpit, the gap was enormous. Stories circulated of students failing not because of their skill, but because the aircraft themselves could not keep pace with modern demands. Engines coughed and failed mid-flight. Cockpits lacked even the most basic simulation of modern radar or weapon systems. Instructors improvised, sketching radar screens on chalkboards and describing in words what their students could not see with their own eyes. Training a pilot under those conditions was like preparing a surgeon with only wooden tools. It created frustration, fear, and a deep sense of inferiority compared to the rest of the world. The symbolism of aviation in Romania only made the wound deeper. This was a nation that once had a proud tradition in aeronautics, with engineers who had contributed to innovations before and during the Second World War. The memory of that era lingered in museums and in the stories of older pilots, a reminder that Romanians had once built aircraft with ambition and originality. But by the 1980s, those memories felt like ghosts haunting the airfields. The gap between past glory and present reality created a question that could no longer be avoided. Could Romania reclaim its place in the skies, or would it remain forever dependent on machines designed elsewhere? The decision to act was not born from luxury, but from necessity. Without a modern trainer, the Air Force could not guarantee the safety of its own pilots. Without domestic development, the country risked being sidelined entirely in the technological race that defined the Cold War. And so, the idea of a new aircraft began to take shape, not as a dream, but as a survival requirement. It would not be easy. Resources were scarce. Engineers worked with limited access to international designs, and political pressure weighed heavily on every decision. But the alternative was worse, continuing to fly into the future with the wings of the past. This is where the story of the IAR-99 truly begins, in a moment of tension, fear, and determination. The stage was set for a bold experiment, a project that would demand more than just technical skill. It would require vision, resilience, and the stubborn will to prove that even a small, isolated nation could carve its own path through the turbulent skies of the Cold War. And as the first lines of blueprints were drawn, the question hung heavy in the air. Could Romania's engineers and pilots turn desperation into innovation and write a new chapter in their country's aviation history? The birth of the project was not a single moment, but a slow gathering of determination, politics, and necessity that eventually converged into one direction. The task fell to the Industria Aeronautica Romana, or IAR, a name that carried the weight of history. 
Founded decades earlier, the company had built fighters, bombers, and trainers that once put Romania on the aviation map. By the mid-1980s, though, the halls of IAR were a mix of ambition and limitation. Engineers knew the challenges intimately. They had to build something modern enough to prepare pilots for the realities of contemporary combat aviation, but they would do it in a country strapped for resources, under a regime that expected miracles with very little fuel to feed them. The leadership wanted a jet that could rival foreign trainers, yet the engineers had to design it with the tools, metals, and systems that were available inside Romania's borders. The first debates were pragmatic. What engine could they trust? The choice eventually fell on the Rolls-Royce Viper, a design with a proven track record. Romania arranged a license to produce it locally, and that decision alone carried both symbolism and practicality. On one hand, it gave the aircraft a western heart, a sign of how Romania carefully balanced between east and west even during the Cold War. On the other, it meant that the engineers could count on reliability and power without depending entirely on Soviet suppliers. The decision to integrate that engine shaped the entire outline of the plane. Wings had to be designed with a certain lift, the fuselage had to be structured to accommodate it, and the cockpit needed to reflect not only the demands of flight training, but also the possibility of combat missions. Unlike the flashy projects of the superpowers, this aircraft would be born from restraint. The designers favored a metal structure with low wings, stable enough to inspire confidence in new pilots, but agile enough to mimic the sensations they would later feel in supersonic fighters. The cockpit was arranged in tandem, the student in front, the instructor behind, both enclosed under a canopy that gave excellent visibility. Visibility mattered not only for training, but for survival. Pilots needed to learn to see threats, to spot terrain, to adjust to the vast openness of the sky. For many cadets, this would be their first taste of modern glass and metal wrapped around them in such a way. The intention was to make the leap from trainer to fighter less intimidating, more natural, even if the fighter in question was generations ahead. But the engineers wanted more than a simple trainer. They envisioned a machine capable of pulling double duty. Romania could not afford to build separate fleets for every need, so the new aircraft would also carry light weapons. Hard points under the wings allowed for bombs, rockets, or gun pods. It would never replace a frontline MiG-21 or any of the heavy Soviet machines, but it could serve as a counterinsurgency tool, a border defender, a weapon of last resort if the skies demanded it. This dual role of trainer and light attack aircraft gave the project credibility within the military, making it easier to secure funding, even when the national economy struggled to keep the lights on in factories and homes. As the design matured, compromises became stories of ingenuity. Where Western trainers used expensive avionics suites, the Romanians simplified, often improvising with components adapted from other programs. Instruments were arranged in ways that mirrored those of fighters, so that cadets would learn instinctively where to look, how to manage speed, altitude, and weapons. Every switch and dial had to serve both the logic of the trainer and the reality of combat. It was a balancing act, one that tested not only the patience of engineers, but the political will of the government. Ceausescu wanted results. He wanted a machine that could be rolled out, photographed, and presented as evidence of Romania's independence. The project, which would soon bear the designation IAR-99, became more than an airplane. For the men and women inside the design bureau, it was a battle against time, politics, and limitations. Test pilots whispered about what it might feel like to climb into a jet built entirely at home. Factory workers imagined the pride of rivets hammered into a fuselage that represented a step forward for their country. In the middle of the Cold War, when so many nations accepted the role of followers in the shadow of superpowers, Romania dared to attempt something that would mark its own path. It was not arrogance, but survival, written in blueprints, bolts, and steel. Subscribe now and join us on this journey through the skies, where every aircraft has a story of ambition, sacrifice, and resilience waiting to be told. Each line of the aircraft carried the tension of its origin. The smooth curve of the nose was not just aerodynamics, but a compromise between cost and performance. The wings stretched out like a cautious handshake, promising stability more than aggression. And yet, in those lines, there was defiance. The very fact that Romania could design and build a jet from scratch was a statement to its neighbors, allies, and rivals. The message was clear, we will not be left behind. Still, every engineer and pilot knew that the true test was not on paper, but in the sky. A trainer that failed to inspire confidence would endanger lives. A trainer that lacked precision would fail the very cadets it was meant to protect. And so, while the political slogans celebrated progress, the quiet conversations in hangars and briefing rooms focused on one thing. When the day came, would the IAAR-99 fly as intended? The answer to that question would not only decide the fate of the aircraft, but also the credibility of Romania's entire aviation industry. The day of that first flight drew closer, with anticipation and anxiety building in equal measure. It was one thing to sketch a dream, another to watch it rise into the air. Everyone involved knew that the moment the wheels left the runway, decades of history, politics, and sacrifice would either be vindicated or betrayed. 
And as the prototype stood ready under the open sky, the future of Romanian aviation balanced delicately on the edge of its wings, preparing to leap into history. The morning of the first flight in December 1985 was cold, the kind of biting winter air that seeped through gloves and uniforms, but for those gathered at the airfield, the chill mattered little. All eyes were on the sleek prototype sitting at the end of the runway. For years, it had been nothing more than drawings, promises, and fragments of metal being shaped in workshops. Now it stood whole, its canopy reflecting the pale sun, its Rolls-Royce Viper engine silent but ready. The tension among the engineers and military officials was palpable. They had risked political wrath, exhausted budgets, and personal reputations to bring the aircraft this far. When the test pilot climbed into the cockpit, Romania's ambition balanced on his shoulders. Every sound of the engine spooling up seemed amplified. Every movement of the aircraft down the runway etched into memory. And then it happened. The nose lifted, the wheels left the ground, and for the first time, the IAR-99 was no longer a dream, it was flying. The aircraft climbed steadily into the winter sky, a moment that confirmed years of effort. For those on the ground, the sight of the jet soaring overhead was more than technical validation. It was a declaration. Romania had built a jet trainer of its own, and it worked. The test lasted only minutes, but those minutes carried symbolic weight that far exceeded their duration. Newspapers later captured the image of the new aircraft, calling it a breakthrough. While internally, engineers quietly exchanged relieved smiles. The hardest part was still ahead, refinement, testing, and eventual service, but the barrier of uncertainty had been crossed. When the IAR-99 entered service, it immediately changed the landscape for Romanian pilots. Cadets who had been forced to learn on aircraft older than themselves now strapped into a machine that finally mirrored the dynamics of the fighters they aspired to fly. Instructors noted how much more confident their students became when training with systems that prepared them for modern combat scenarios. The cockpit layout was deliberately designed to echo the experience of transitioning into frontline fighters, reducing the learning curve that had once put young aviators at risk. Beyond the training schools, the jet proved its worth in secondary roles as well. Its hard points allowed it to carry rockets and bombs, making it a flexible light attack aircraft, capable of defending borders or conducting ground support missions in emergencies. Through the late 1980s and into the turbulent 1990s, the IAR-99 became a symbol of continuity. Romania faced dramatic political upheaval, with Ceausescu's fall and the nation's slow transition into a new era. The aviation industry, like many sectors, suffered instability. Budgets were slashed, priorities shifted, and many projects stalled or collapsed altogether. Yet the IAR-99 survived. It remained on airfields, continued to train new generations, and stood as a reminder that even during crisis, Romania had managed to create something lasting. Few military programs could claim the same resilience. The next chapter for the aircraft came in the form of modernization. As the Romanian Air Force gradually moved toward integration with NATO standards in the 1990s and early 2000s, it became clear that the trainer needed updates. That was how the IAR-99 Shoem, or Falcon, was born. The modernization program equipped the aircraft with Israeli avionics, a striking choice that underscored Romania's willingness to look westward for partnerships. Suddenly, the cockpit featured multifunctional displays, modern navigation systems, and weapon compatibility that made the trainer relevant again in a rapidly changing world. Pilots, who had once learned through improvisation, now trained with systems that mirrored NATO fighters, including the F-16s that Romania would eventually acquire. One of the most remarkable aspects of the IAR-99 story is how a country with limited resources managed to extend the lifespan and relevance of an aircraft across decades. The upgrades meant that by the time Romania joined NATO in 2004, the Shoim variant was already helping pilots adapt to Western doctrines. Training flights prepared them not just in flying skills, but in the mentality of modern aerial warfare. This transformation was critical. Without it, the gap between legacy Soviet equipment and NATO technology would have been dangerously wide. Instead, the IAR-99 became a bridge, a stepping stone that allowed Romanian pilots to transition with greater ease into a completely different system of defense. Curiously, despite its clear potential, the aircraft never achieved export success. Other nations considered trainers from Italy, Britain, or the Czech Republic, leaving the IAR-99 as a uniquely national machine. This lack of foreign adoption might seem like a failure at first glance, but within Romania, it gave the aircraft an almost mythic quality. It was not a commodity sold abroad, it was a creation that remained purely Romanian. The pride attached to it grew with each class of pilots that graduated in its cockpit. To this day, aviation enthusiasts in Romania recall their first flights in the IAR-99 with a sense of personal connection, as if the aircraft were more than metal and rivets, but a companion in the formative stages of their careers. Even into the 21st century, when drones and fifth-generation fighters dominate discussions of air power, the IAR-99 remains relevant. It continues to fly at bases across the country, not only as a practical training platform, but as a living reminder of a bold experiment in national self-reliance. 
When you see one taking off today, you are not just watching a jet trainer. You're watching the echo of a decision made during some of the most pressured years of the Cold War. It carries within its wings the story of engineers who worked against scarcity, of pilots who trusted a new machine in uncertain skies, and of a nation that dared to put its own name back into the history of aviation. The journey of the IAR-99 does not end here, though. Questions linger about its future. How much longer can the aircraft remain in service? What role will it play as Romania deepens its commitment to modern NATO operations and introduces ever more advanced platforms? And perhaps most importantly, will there come a time when the country once again decides to take the risk of designing a new aircraft from scratch, carrying forward the spirit that first gave life to the IAR-99? Those questions remain open, but every time the aircraft rises above the runway, it whispers the same. Reminder, it is possible to dream, to build, and to fly, even when the world tells you it cannot be done.